Okay, welcome back. So now we have a session on the core vision with Wendy and Sam and a comment from Umberto, right? It's good to know that you are chairing a session just when you, you start the session. <laughs> so, okay, shall we start with yeah. you? Yes, uh, thank, thank, I'll take this. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, what we want to do is try to lay out uh, with rather broad strokes uh, the, our, our overall objectives, uh, what we think is uh, perhaps novel and uh, one of the reasons why we're so excited to be part of this project and so happy to be with all of you uh, uh, working on it. Um, uh, some of these images will be familiar. Uh, they concern the various uh, things we've done so far and the scope of the project. But I want to go right to the question of paradigms. Uh, when we talk about a paradigm in economics, very often we mean uh, something that Thomas Kuhn referred to uh, as essentially what do good undergraduates learn uh, in their, say, second, third, or th uh, fourth year courses. Uh, it's not anything that any person ever wrote on that topic, but it's kind of the main messages. Uh, and um, so uh, when a new problem or a new set of problems comes along, uh, the Great Depression and a new set of ideas, uh, the, uh, Keynes's, uh, the Keynesian Revolution, often we get a new textbook. That's happened uh, before also. It happened with Alfred Marshall's uh, great textbook of 1890, and it happened even before that with John Stuart Mill. Uh, and uh, so these, there is a succession, you see, about every half century or so. So we think just even by the calendar, uh, it's about time uh, we had a new one. Uh, the basic content of what's in the textbooks today was set by Samuelson in 1948 uh, when uh, he basically added Keynes to Marshall. And that's, that's how he changed the great Marshallian text. Uh, and now, thinking back on the period when Samuelson was writing under, after the, the, the shadow of the Great Depression, there were a number of great thinkers in economics at the time and the other social sciences and philosophy. Uh, here are some of them. Obviously, Keynes was one, uh, but also uh, there was Nash and von Neumann studying uh, strategic interactions. Uh, there was uh, Hayek uh, making the point that information is scarce and local. Uh, there, uh, there were these three and many other uh, great economists at the time. Uh, and what's interesting about the Samuelson text is this. Uh, uh, it, uh, basically, it was, uh, as I say, Keynes plus Marshall. Uh, and as a result, we missed out on some really important ideas which were then being introduced by very great and well-established thinkers. These were not minor figures, uh, Hayek, uh, Nash, uh, and others. Uh, and then think about it. There were a lot of great minds who were not invited to the party. Uh, there was Minsky, there was uh, Schumpeter, uh, uh, there's uh, Herbert Simon, uh, Albert Hirschman, uh, uh, Ronald Coase, uh, Eleanor Ostrom a bit later. These are all people who strangely, the basic ideas of these people, which now f uh, form a rather fundamental part of how in our research activities and in our policy advice, these are the people whose economics forms the, the foundation of what we do. They're not in the Samuelsonian uh, paradigm. Um, now, when we talk about a paradigm in a social science, in particular economics, it, we, we have to, it has to do something for us. It has to say, what is the economy? Uh, what are people like? Uh, how do we interact with each other? Uh, what are the economic interaction uh, outcomes of the way that we interact? Uh, how can we evaluate these things? How could public policy make them better? Now, every paradigm says something about those things. Uh, and so, I mean, this is a list of things about which you have to have a position. Uh, if, uh, and of course, the paradigms do. I'm going to come back to that list because I think actually economics has changed very radically since Samuelson 48. And I think CORE has benefited hugely from that because we can now put into an intro text uh, what's happened. Uh, when I say that textbooks haven't changed much, just think a little bit. Pull anything off the shelf and you'll find out that economics, the economy and economics is taught sometimes as if economics is shopping. Uh, this is Varian's uh, text, which I admire very much. Uh, and it's not at all unusual. The first chapter is on the market. Uh, and if it weren't on the market, it would be on constrained optimization. Those are the only two ways you can begin an economics course. Uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, uh, now, it's... Uh, I don't think Varian is unusual at all. 
Um, it, of course, Varian being a very modern economist, he's aware of uh, new problems and new th things that can be added to the curriculum. Uh, so uh, what happens to them? They go to the back of the book and some of them don't even get in the book at all. Look at the stuff in yellow there. I was trying to find out what Varian uh, said about disequilibrium. There's no a disequilibrium in the index. So I checked out what he said about equilibrium and what he says basically is we don't really know how, how equilibrium is established, so we're just going to assume things are in equilibrium, which means they cannot possibly have any dynamic analysis. Uh, and uh, that's just a line in the book. Uh, and, um, but then uh, the back of the book becomes a place where all the new stuff in economics, which has changed the way we think as practicing research economists and policy advisors. I mean, look at this. Uh, game theory is at the end of the book. Uh, or behavioral economics. And it gets worse. Externalities come almost at the end. And, uh, of course, public goods come after that. So forget market failures. There's something that you read about at the beach after the course is over, if ever. And the, the, the final thing, which is truly amazing, asymmetric information to which the author of this book has contributed so much comes as the very last chapter. Uh, now that happens to be an intermediate micro uh, uh, text. I have, I'm interested in that because a little bit of self-advertising here. Following on core, there is an intermediate microtext, or there will be shortly. It's available. Be in touch with me. I can give you the pre-version of it. It's a, it's a non-variant uh, introduction to second and third year micro. Uh, uh, the, uh, the intro courses are not really different. Uh, if you look here, uh, here's Mankiw, uh, Krugman. Uh, it's all the same, fundamentally unchanged. Um, now, <clears throat> suppose that the course began differently. Uh, suppose that it, it, it tried to address the kind of questions that really are the questions that the students were wanting answers to and why they became economists. And which, by the way, I'm willing to guess, are the reasons why virtually everybody in this room became economists. That's the reason why I became an economist. Uh, it wasn't uh, simply to study shopping or constrained optimization. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, core, since our, be our beginning, We've asked, we kind of stumbled into this, it was fun, and then we got such interesting results, we kept doing it. We've asked all around the world this question. Before, in the opening day of a course, before anybody's heard anything about economics, we asked this question, we asked the students to write down on a piece of paper, what are the main issues, the pressing issues that economists today should deal with? Some of you have seen the resulting word clouds. You know a word cloud has the size of the font, is the frequency with which the expression is mentioned. But for, if you haven't seen them, form in your mind what you think your students would say. How big would the word, uh, would the, the fonts be for the various word clouds? Well, here's one from the Universidad de los Andes in uh, Bogota, a very fine university. Uh, and you can see what they're interested in. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, being, of course, Colombia, they're interested in peace. Uh, there's a translation uh, for you of the same thing. But what was striking to us is these figures are virtually the same anywhere in the world. This is from uh, UCL. Now look at the date. That's UCL in the fall of 2016, before Donald Trump was elected. They think Donald Trump is one of the main economic problems in, in the world, even before, <laughs> even before he's elected. Uh, yeah. Um, this is uh, Humboldt University. We have about 20 of these. Uh, there are some differences. French-speaking countries uh, f uh, tend to uh, put unemployment uh, in more prominently. But it's virtually the same. And what, what do these words have in common? These words have in common, which is you will not find them in chapter one of your introductory textbook, nor will you find them analyzed anywhere until maybe the last chapters. And worst of all, the tools that you will learn in chapters 1 through 20 or whatever it is that you really study, the tools that you're going to learn are not actually optimally uh, designed to answer these questions, nor are they what modern economics is. Um, so um, if, I mean, we've identified a set of problems here partly by asking these questions. Uh, you would have a different list, your students might, but we suspect that Prominent would be the, the, the problem of innovation, wealth creation, environmental problems, inequality, fluctuations, instability, add or subtract from the list, but that's kind of what the students would like to be hearing about. Probably some stuff about globalization would be t the top on their list. 
if this is what your course is going to uh, allow people to study, then you're going to have to introduce some new concepts, uh, not at the back of the book, but at the front of the book, somehow. And that's what we tried to do. It's been a very hard process, not easy to do. It's taken a tremendous amount of work discussing amongst ourselves, trying, trying out various things. So let me try, uh, this, uh, these taxonomic things are always a bit difficult, but let me try to introduce to you what I call, the, or what we call the Samuelsonian paradigm. It could be called neoclassical, but that sounds a little bit ideological. I really wanted to just talk about what's actually taught. Uh, now, again, uh, you might want to parse this a little differently, but it's fair to say that the people that make up the paradigm are farsighted and self-interested. In most interactions, people are price takers. Information is complete. Uh, markets are, as a result, complete. Uh, uh, contracts are complete, rather. Uh, the institutions on which, which we study primarily are markets. We'll have more to say about that uh, tomorrow. Uh, History is largely ignored. It's used as a mine for examples of how the theory works. It's never used as uh, something which sets problems that we, which we should try to understand. There are differences among people. Uh, some people like pizza, other people like beer. That's why we use a fascinating example of how much beer and pizza you should buy as the main way that we teach people how to do constrained optimization. Uh, the, um, there is power, namely market power, Governments also have powers. Economic rents play a role in the model, but they play a role only because of mistaken government policies in which governments intervene so as to prevent markets from working as with minimum wages or rent controls or, uh, say, import, subsidy, uh, import licenses. Stability is assumed to be the case. Remember what it is that Varian said. We're just going to assume the thing's in equilibrium. Uh, and evaluation is the Pareto criterion. That's it. Uh, now, sometimes people with a slightly guilty conscience say, well, yes, there are some other things that might be brought in, but they say it once, and that's it. So let's now think about what a paradigm over here might be like. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Alvin said this morning, there's nothing modest about core. Uh, I won't apologize for that. I think it's time for really uh, trying to do something fundamentally different. So here are some things that we think we've uh, gathered from the way economists today do research that are really uh, not new to the profession, but perhaps new in the intro course. People are also cognitively limited, and they're also given to uh, commitments to fairness following social norms, as well as being self-interested. Uh, um, the firms and families uh, and so on who make up our uh, dramatis personae of economic models, they're actors. They're not passive. They're price setters, wage setters, interest rate setters, and so on. Um, information, as Hayek said, is incomplete. It's costly. Therefore, contracts are incomplete. They don't cover such things as the labor effort that people put in, nor do they cover the, the repayment of a loan. And I could go on and on. They don't actually uh, allow you to enforce the quality of a variable quality product, uh, and so on. Uh, institutions, therefore, include much more than just contracts and markets, but they include informal norms. They, inf they uh, involve the exercise of power by firms, uh, banks, and so on. Uh, history is not only a source of cool examples. It's also the source of the problems we're trying to understand, uh, the challenges which our models have to actually address. Uh, we have heterogeneous people, but they're not heterogeneous, as I say, about pizza and beer. They're heterogeneous in the positions they occupy in the economy. Uh, to use an old word, they're heterogeneous in the class positions which they occupy. Some are employers and some are employees. Some are lenders, some are borrowers, and so on. Our heterogeneity allows us to have a well-integrated theory of inequality in, uh, in that framework. Uh, economic rents are endemic to a well-functioning function, functioning economy. Think about the labor market in which somehow God came down and said there could be no rents. Then there would be no employment rents. And therefore, the worker with an incomplete contract would have no reason to do his or her job very well because she would be indifferent between her current position and her next best alternative. That's the meaning of no rent. Uh, rents are essential to how a capitalist economy works, not to mention Schumpeterian rents, innovation rents, and so on. They're an essential part of the core curriculum. 
Uh, of course, instability is as much a part of the, pro the process, the dynamic process of capitalism as is instability, uh, as is stability. And finally, we include fairness as part of the evaluative structure. Now, um, I want to close with a couple of remarks about pluralism before turning over to Wendy. Uh, economics is justly criticized because of its lack of attention to the insights of other disciplines, law, political science, uh, of the other social sciences, biology, and so on. Now, uh, in defense of economics, I can say this. If you are part of the Samuelsonian paradigm, then you should not be criticized for ignoring the insights of the other social sciences or history. Why? In that paradigm, we assume unique equilibria. There's no role for history or path dependence. In that paradigm, we assume complete contracts. So there's no role for social norms in the completion of the contract. Because we assume complete contracts, for example, at work, there's no role for the power of the employer over the worker, the threats that the employer may give, for, for example, termination and so on. So there's no political aspect of the economy. It's perfectly OK, if you're in that paradigm, to ignore the other social sciences. And so the last half century, which has seen economics isolate itself from the other social sciences, is really a result of that paradigm. It's not a mistake that they made. Their mistake was the paradigm. Once you accept that, uh, being lacking pluralism was a consequence. Uh, and so uh, I, I could, we could go on about all of these. I've given you some of the examples. Uh, if the core paradigm is the one you're using, you have to refer to what other scholars have learned in the other disciplines. And this is not because we insist you should be interested, for example, in the family or in the, uh, or in the government or in politics. No, not at all. If you're interested in how wages are set and how prices are set, you'd better know something about sociology, political science, and so on. It's an integral part of very, answering very traditional economic questions. Another note on pluralism. Uh, I, for many, many years, taught history of economics. It's a wonderful field. I think it's a very important part of the undergraduate instruction. Some people uh, have suggested that the way to repair the lack of pluralism at the intro level is to have an intro course which is primarily a kind of paradigm tournament between classical economics, Marx, neoclassical, and so on. And I believe that a good course could be created that way. Uh, it, there are many things which could be said for it. It would train students in, for example, being able to criticize other points of view and understand reciprocal criticisms. So I'm not demeaning that approach, but I think the approach to the intro course today should be to teach the economics which we now have that's available. And so rather than having these guys argue with each other, uh, we take their insights, and you'll see Valras and Marx and Keynes and all the other guys who I mentioned as part of this uh, um, uh, part of the curriculum, not juxtaposed as in the approach of the history of thought advocates, but rather as integrated. Uh, and now, um, teaching this way involves not just a change in what's in the course, but how it's taught, and Wendy will talk about that. Yeah, so I, I want to kind of move from this uh, this kind of overarching framework about how economics has been taught and how uh, the, this process of creating the core cause the economy has uh, produced teaching material. So um, the uh, uh, one statement I think that uh, encapsulates uh, what we've done is to say that what we do is we begin from facts and complex problems using narratives and data. And there's one of these stories, typically at the beginning of every unit, that's uh, trying to bring students in uh, with, a, with a real and uh, hopefully interesting problem. So that compares with the standard approach to teaching economics, which is a deductive method uh, where you begin with the theory, whether that's uh, in difference curves in this example of constrained optimization, and then you illustrate with particular examples. So you go from the theory, which is what you put in front of the student, and then you find an example here and there that helps you illustrate it. And if you teach uh, in this way, that uh, in the first, the deductive way, that has strong consequences for what follows. And similarly, if we take the core approach, 
that has equally strong consequences for everything that follows. So uh, the kind of principles that we've used in creating the, uh, the economy have been based on the sort of integrative pluralism uh, centred on the new paradigm that Sam has now sketched for you. That's number one. Number two is a common set of modelling tools, uh, such as feasible sets and indifference curves. So it's not that we throw the indifference curves out the window. In fact, you could say we kind of embrace that framework and really push it into corners of at least the first year teaching where it's not been seen much before. And uh, we, uh, the background is always there, if you like, which is the objective is not to teach economics, but the objective is to help our students understand how the economy works. So we're always having to ask ourselves, are we delivering on the motivating problem? Okay, that problem, that complex problem that we started with. And we should also be asking, is this a good model? And I, I think that's, uh, it's not always explicitly there in front of you in the text, but for many, many of us when we've been teaching, that's always been part of, uh, the, for example, the structure of the lectures or the structure of the exercises that we get students to work on. So just to take an example and maybe to take a sort of very kind of, you know, sense traditional example of teaching constrained op optimization. And here I, I've uh, superimposed the, the green onto the red to make you aware, those of you who haven't yet explored the new Economy, Society and Public Policy ebook, that, uh, that you, can, you can find some new stuff in there. You also find the stuff that's in the economy taught, taught slightly differently with a different audience in mind. So this is where we uh, begin with the individual actor facing a constraint. And we do this by mo motivating it with historical and cross-country data. So that's our complex problem out there in the world that we want to get students intrigued by. We then extend the use of the concept of the feasible set, which was first introduced in, in Unit 2, introducing <laughs> difference curves, the two trade-offs. And then we ask if it's a good model. So we kind of develop the model and then we confront students with, is it, you know, what do we mean by these, uh, are people really conducting these kind of calculations uh, when we think of the MRS, MRT, which is going to come back again and again, and we place in front of them the, the trial and error interpretation, which is a much more convincing one to, to students. And we also bring in qualifications to just seeing an understanding of changes in working hours over time and of differences in working hours across countries as just being about uh, uh, what we can capture in a constrained optimization framework. And then we return to the data. So this is how we do it. Those of you who've taught this unit will have hopefully had fun with students. Uh, they they find, typically find these kind of data you know, genuinely intriguing. Uh, uh, they, they particularly it's very easy to get them interested in the cross-country comparisons here. Uh, looking here on the lower, the lower chart at average hours of free time and comparing two countries, the Netherlands and the UK, with similar living standards and with really very different amounts of time uh, being spent uh, in, you know, as working time. So we use that to motivate teaching uh, income and substitution effects and uh, those of you who haven't yet got into the diagrams in core, these interactive diagrams, uh, the one thing we can say very openly is a winner with the students. You ask them what they like, they always say, we like these clickable, these clickable diagrams. And then we go back to the data and use that framework of income and substitution effects to interpret literally the numbers that we began at the beginning of the lecture. And even just that idea of how do you transform numbers into a diagram is something that uh, for, for many students that's a kind of eye opener. Okay, this is how we, us the students, we can think about connecting things that we're interested in with measuring data and with then representing them using a model. There's a, uh, uh, <coughs> this is an example of one of the 
Economist in Action videos, this uh, economist sociologist, why do we work so hard, uh, which uh, again is, um, is a way of connecting the modelling with the initial question. Some, something that we've spent, we spent a lot of time on when we were uh, having all the kind of workshopping to build up the core material was with this, what you can see here. So let me just go through it again. So what we were, what we were really trying to do <coughs> is to think about how can we select the modelling tools from the toolkit of economists to, to apply to the, the much richer uh, framework that we were developing. And this is just an example here of <coughs> using the feasible set and indifference curves to talk about different kinds of preferences. So here to represent both self-regarding and altruistic preferences. The, the, uh, the middle one is a, is a bargaining problem. We've already seen the right-hand one. This is a way of thinking about the standard problem of the firm setting the price, but using the isoprofit curves rather than the marginal revenue curve. And again, it's, it's giving the idea that there's a toolkit that can be put to work uh, in, the, in the service of many different problems. And this is very novel in the first year to think of the macroeconomic policymaker, again, as, a, as an actor who has objectives and also has constraints. So this is the way that the macroeconomic policymaker's preferences are represented and the constraint that... Uh, the central bank faces in terms of the, the Phillips curve. So that's a kind of methodological thing which when you're teaching and thinking about designing your teaching I think is, is good to keep in mind because it, it helps to convey to students this sort of multi-purpose toolkit that, uh, that they will uh, hopefully they will come to really like because they can see that it's, it can indeed be used in lots of different settings. Rather than kind of jumping from chapter one to chapter two to some kind of model in chapter one and then you have a different kind of model in chapter two and a different model in chapter three and never are they put together uh, in, in, in this kind of way. So this is another example. So th uh, this is a bubble in the housing market where we have introduced earlier uh, unstable and stable equilibria and then we apply it to uh, the housing market and then we can sh show how the same model can be used for a completely different problem which is uh, the problem of uh, summer sea ice. So this, I'm not going to go through the modelling but you, I think you get the idea that for students this can be kind of genuinely empowering because they think, aha, okay, I've got this tool and I can use it to think about problems that, that at least at first sight seem of a completely different character. The implications are not just, if you like, for method but also for structure and for the order in which uh, things appear in the core text. So uh, let me um, just run through this and I should say that these slides will all be available. So we're going to get the Core Labs, which is a sharing platform, uh, working over the course of uh, these, these couple of days. And you'll be able to dip in there and, and uh, take the slides. You may find some of them useful or just to, to, to go through them again. So we begin, uh, how did the world come to look like it does today? That's essentially Units 1 and 2, uh, where we introduce uh, institutions and rent-seeking innovation. Then we... Uh, begin with the economic actor. That's the example I just gave you about working hours. So the single actor doing the best they can. Then there's more than one actor, so it's, it's strategic interaction, introducing the idea of the rules of the game and what people are like. That leads directly into institutions as the rules of the game, where power, bargaining and inequality are uh, presented in an analytical frame in Unit 5. And then that's applied to the contemporary firm where the, uh, the, the parties are identified as the key actors in the firm, owners, employers and workers. So some might think of that sort of Units 1 to 5 as being the core of the core 
in, in, some, in some senses. This, this kind of gives you the, the, the kind of working parts that allow the, the rest of the, uh, the material to develop. More uh, standard, so within the price setting firm, is a, a, a topic that, that you would find in a standard course, although we teach it rather differently. And then price taking markets come late. So many of the complaints from A-level students are, hey, I spend all my time learning about supply and demand, and where is it? Where is it? Week after week, where's the supply and demand? And uh, this, this, the logic of this is, of course, that actually understanding the equilibrium of a price-taking market is really quite sophisticated. It's a complicated, fairly peculiar idea. And we've taken the route of, of introducing actors doing things before we move to the more abstract idea of taking prices, which is something that is, is, uh, t tends to be harder for students to really grasp. And then uh, uh, wage setting, price setting and unemployment, the labour market in unit, unit 9 is putting together these, uh, a, a lot of what we've done so far and we make the explicit contrast in Unit 9 between, we, if you like, we've prepared the ground for saying why is it the case that the market for bread is different for, from the market for baristas? Okay, so why is the labour market a very different kind of market from the market for a commodity that's sold in price-taking markets? That's extended to the second very different kind of market, which is the credit market in Unit 10. How markets work and, and uh, making use of the concepts of static and dynamic rents uh, happens in 11. Uh, why market failures are the norm is in Unit 12. The, the green one, so economy, society and, and public policy, has a, a different structure. It's oriented towards uh, explicitly non-specialist students or, or people studying public policy. Again, we begin with how did the world come to look like the way it does, but we bring democracy as well as capitalism into that very opening unit. So that's a bit different. We begin with social interactions and public policy. That's what's motivating probably this group of students more. And there's this key unit, which some of you might want to, uh, to spend some time on, which sets out the model of public policy that is characteristic of, uh, of the approach set out in the ESP, ESPP text. It hinges on the two criteria for evaluation that Sam highlighted, efficiency and fairness. And at its centre, it has the notion of the Nash equilibrium as the, as the key concept that the policymaker has to have in mind when thinking about designing policy and whether or not it would be expected to have its intended effects. So that comes kind of really up front in the ESPP course with lots of examples. And then much of the other stuff follows, which I won't go through in, in any detail. Uh, and then you'll see by the magic of uh, planning, the ESPP course gets to, uh, gets to Unit 12. And then that opens the way for two options for people who begin with ESPP. Either they can go on to Unit 13 if they're wanting to teach a more micro and public policy oriented first semester and then move on to macro. So seamlessly you go from uh, red to green. If you're colorblind, it would just all look the same anyway. Um, and and the, the macro units follow. Alternatively, you might want to really dig in, and this would be especially appropriate with graduate students, you really want to dig into the public policy issues and take advantage of the capstones that, uh, that CORE has created and which will often, you know, there's just not space to find them in a traditional course structure. But you could, you could well combine 1 to 12 of ESPP and then move on to the, uh, essentially the capstones. So let me say a, cu a couple more things. And I just, I've just highlighted here... Um, this is from a couple of slides back. Institutions as the rules of the game. The application to contemporary firms and then the price setting firm. Combining that with wage setting 
price setting and unemployment and with the credit market and what do we get? We get students who are ready, who are ready for modern macro. What do we mean by modern macro? We mean macroeconomics with heterogeneous agents, with firms, employees, lenders, borrowers, banks and the central bank, where all those actors are making purposeful decisions. So that's the, the logic that, um, if you like, drives the, the structure of the, from the first set of units into uh, the, the, what would traditionally be called macro. So micro and macro are taught with a common language, but it's not the common language of supply and demand, or the pseudo common language of supply, demand, aggregate supply and aggregate demand, but it, it's a genuinely common language which allows the economy to be taught as it's represented um, on, on the right-hand side. So the economy embedded in society and also we can make the links to the biosphere. We put a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, what economists do. So throughout uh, all of the text, there's, there's a lot of research and that's again very unusual for first years to kind of be face to face with, with people doing economics. But we think that's really important, partly because we're, we're really trying to recruit people into wanting to be economists because it's, you know, they can do all kinds of exciting things. And so we show them these examples. So this is uh, Esther Duflo. It's linked to a multiple choice question. Students tend to concentrate if they have a multiple choice question. So they will actually flick on, you know, click onto that video, watch it, hopefully get somewhat inspired. There's uh, Petra Moser talking about innovation and the lessons from uh, that we can learn from 18th century or 19th century, actually, Italian operas. Again, it's linked to an exercise, so you can set that uh, as, as something for students to do. And this is Anat Ad Admati talking very passionately about banking, regu banking regulation and is a natural, if, and perhaps to even show in a lecture, uh, when you're talking about the financial crisis. So I'm going to stop there, and Umberto is going to... Respond. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me hmm, thank the opportunity to be here when uh, Wendy and Sam invited me hmm, to participate in, the, in this workshop. I thought it was a no, great opportunity. I was very flattered. Then I found out what I had to do. Then I wasn't that huh? mm -hmm. thankful because I have a few minutes to talk about no, this huge project. And actually, uh, I have to talk about it as an outsider. Hmm? So I'm, a, I'm an outsider because I'm not part of the, eh, of the group who you know, created uh, the economy. Uh, and I'm an outsider in the sense that I'm not hmm, using the economy yet. Okay? So what I assume is that what they wanted hmm, about comments is that they wanted the view of an outsider and that's what I, uh, a potential user. Of, of the economy. And, and, and that's actually my role. Huh? So my idea is that I'm going to, hmm? so I'm planning to, to use uh, the economy starting next year. Uh, I came to the economy, hmm? so I follow it, hmm? I have, even though I haven't been here, so I, I signed to the web page back in 2000, hmm? I think 14 or 15, hmm? at the very beginning. And I came to it basically because of you no know, huge dissatisfaction, hmm? both with the way we teach and with, uh, about the material or the content that, that we teach. So in the last years, I've been working more on, on the way we teach and how to innovate there. Uh, and that I will be talking about that hmm, tomorrow. Uh, and now that I think I have hmm, a structure that, that I like, I'm getting into hmm, the, uh, the idea of, of, of what's the content. Hmm? So... Let me just hmm, give you a few uh, reflections. Right? I don't have that, that many minutes, but let me talk about some reflections about the economy. And let me think about it as what could be the elements we have to think hmm, if we want the economy to be adopted. Hmm? So I, 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 and I tend, to, I tend to be pragmatic, right? So if we want, hmm, so if I want to be uh, drawn into the, into the the idea of teaching, hmm, changing my course and teaching economics, there are three things that are important. Hmm? So it's important what's the content, it's important what's the format, 
and it's important what is the material, what are the resources hmm, that are available. And they have to be, hmm, all three, they have to be attractive enough in order to make people uh, switch to, to, this, to this new paradigm. So let me talk a little bit about uh, all three. Uh, so about the content, what I have to say is, is my view is that it's really comprehensive. It gives a broad spectrum with interesting and motivating questions. So and that's, hmm, and that's the first point. And I will start hmm, with some praising what are the, the good things and I make some comments later on. Uh, the second question is, is it a response to students' claims? Hmm? Because that's some of the things that when you read the, the economy, so this was, no, there was this need hmm, for, for something else, for a different way of teaching. And I think, yes, it is a response to, to a student's claims. I think also it's a, it's a, it's a response to instructors' claim, and that's, and that's uh, for example, my case. I don't think it, it gives all the answers. It's the solution for everything. And I think there is the, the danger of the threat that we go to, uh, to core hoping that it will solve all the problems. And this morning, when I was in the, actually in the session of people who were using core, I realized that, for example, one of the big issues is, is what's the integration between economics and math. Hmm? So how much math, how much uh, verbal explanation, and a big share or, or a big amount of the discussion was devoted about whether we, you know, we have a problem with the students not being prepared enough about math. Well, core actually, according to some people, helps on that. According to other people, it's not so helpful. But it's not, uh, no, it cannot be the solution for everything. So we have to, hmm, to think that it will be, that, that it's a change, and, and at least that's my, my view. But if we go with the expectation that this is going to be the solution to all problems, then we are going to get some deceptions there. Uh, the second question is, is it revolutionary? So it's really a revolution. Hmm? So I think it is and it's not. Hmm? So it is revolutionary if you compare it with standard textbooks. Hmm? So it's really a different view of the economy, a different view of the, of, of, of the questions and the, and the economic paradigms. It's not revolutionary because this is what we already have in the graduate programs. It's what we see in interesting and relevant economic research. So they are not inventing, so that's my view. Hmm? So the core is not inventing something new. Hmm? It's not something that it's, so it's, it's changing the way we teach something we are already hmm? using, but it hasn't, it didn't go down hmm? to, the, to the origins. Uh, so I, I think it is transformative. Hmm? So I don't know if it's, the, eh? it's the, the best word, it's the best one that came to me. So I think it, it, it uh, and, and that's the way I take it. Hmm? So it's a way to transform the way we teach. So uh, in, in that sense, I think it's, it's more hmm, of, of a positive view of, of, of the core. Uh, what I like, hmm, and I, one of the things I would like to, to, to highlight is, is the idea that the objective is to motivate, enlighten, and, and aspire. Okay? Uh, what I've learned hmm, is that the, the, the way we, the way we we learn things is we create these uh, connections, synapses, connections in our brain. Hmm? Uh, the, and, and this I was in a workshop recently and, and one of the things I, I found out is that this is the way we learn, but the problem is that when we learn the wrong things, we learn it also the same way. So de-learning, it's really difficult because you have to break the synapses, okay? And it turns out that the best way to break the synapses is by surprises. Mm? Uh, so when they tell you something you don't expect, when they challenge you with non-intuitive results or non-intuitive questions, then it's easier to break these synapses than if they repeat you a hundred times, you no, know, the way you thought about this is not right, this is, this is the other type. And that's also some other point that I think I like. Mm? Uh, and that's what I think it's important. Hmm? This, this view of starting from, from the complexity of economic system from, from early on in the, in the book. Uh, and then I have this example, and maybe I have to revise my, my view, but I, I thought, so the labor market, it's, it's, it's the chapter or the example I, I, like, I like the best because I'm, no, I've been teaching the labor market in the standard hmm? 
some of the paradigm in which you know the market is perfect we don't have unemployment mm? uh, uh, involuntary unemployment cannot exist and the only way to get involuntary unemployment is because you have government intervention who's not needed mm? uh, that's not needed there uh, here the paradigm really changes the focus and puts this inevitability of unemployment which may have implications farther than just, just teaching. It's really, and that's why I like this, this example, because it's really a change in how we observe the economy, how we, see, how we see the world. Now, this morning I found out from people who teach this that actually this is you know, probably one of the hardest topics to teach about the, about the course. But maybe this is the reason why it's so interesting. Right, uh, and it's hard because because the question is hard and the framework and the framework is hard. So I think, hmm, and I shouldn't do this, but uh, let me just feel tempted to it. So I think it was Einstein. Huh? So I'm improvising here, who said that you know uh, science has to or the model has to be as simple as possible, but not simpler than necessary, hmm? or something like that. Hmm? Uh, so so this is one of the cases that if we simplify the model because it has to be. Hmm, we want everybody to understand it, we actually alter what we want, what we want to explain. But of course, I'm uh, uh, not going to say hmm, everything about uh, no, praising all the things I like about core. Uh, let me just say that uh, I would like some issues to be more prominent. Hmm? And here there could be, hmm, I could be biased for my own hmm, uh, interest, but, uh, but I would like the measures of well-being to be more prominent. Right now, it exists. There is, hmm, if I remember correct, there is a Leibniz section or, uh, about, about well-being. Uh, it's really on a side. Hmm? And well-being is something important, and, and, and it's something that may change the way of, of seeing economics. Hmm? Uh, the other thing is it's, it's the difference between positive and normative economics. Uh, it's there, and so I'm not saying that it's not in the core, but I think it could be, hmm, it should be more emphasized the idea of when hmm, we talk about positive, when we talk about normative economics. Not only because hmm, in the book, it's, it, it doesn't show, in the book, it show up in the book, but because what I find is that in real life, people confuse this, and even economists, and even when you go to seminars and people do research, they tend to confuse positive with, with normative economics. So I think it's something that it could be, it could be nice to, to emphasize from the very beginning on people we want to, we want to uh, talk about economics. And then, talking about normatives, I think the ethics behind normative analysis is something that it could be nice uh, to, to have, to, to, to be more prominent. Mm? So, for example, the quality of opportunity is missing. At least I couldn't find it. Mm? Uh, I checked the... Uh, the index and couldn't find hmm, this thing. It talks about roles and, and, and actually it presents, hmm, unless I miss some section there, it presents utilitarianism as a value-free form. Hmm. So the example, hmm, the, the most relevant example here is, is in the uh, chapter about environmental economics. There is a discussion about the stern norhaus approach to discounting and here really but it's behind it, it's, it's a vision, hmm? it's, it's a, dif a different ethical vision, but it's assumed that just adding the utility of different generations, it's value free, it's what we should do, hmm? because it's really, hmm? it's one of the points where it's not clear whether it's normative, it's positive, where we are talking, so I think this is a good example in that sense, and it's not clear either uh, what are the, 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 normative, the normative issue. Uh, and finally, uh, I would say in terms of, of, of content, and this could be the product of how the, the project has, has, uh, has evolved, because there are a lot of collaboration, everybody contributes, and everybody adds something, what you end up is with something that it may be too wordy. Hmm? So, and, and there is the risk of losing a student's focus with lengthy, lengthy narratives. Hmm? And again, we are again in the trade-off hmm, between do we want to go more formal, mathematical, which gives you a discipline and reduce Hmm? You are able to explain with a single graph or with a single formula. You are able to explain uh, a, a concept that otherwise you need uh, two, three, four pages to, to talk about it. 
Uh, so this is, mm, these are my comments uh, related to, to content. So let me just mm, find, so this is something that I, that I kept from the, mm, from kind of the very beginning. Mm. So, uh, so this is by the time where Alex was in the, he was a postdoc in MIT. Mm. If I remember correctly, he's in Oxford right now. Huh? So, and, and I think really this is, this is a good summary and this is what, I, what attracts me, mm, or what brought me to, to co, huh? the idea that core turns the undergraduate economics curricula into an empirically grounded study of the real world core. Okay, so now regarding format mm, and resources. So regarding format, it's a free ebook. I'm completely for it. So I think it's time mm, that we break the uh, the monopoly of the of the publishers. Mm. Uh, and. Uh, it would be nice to have a PDF. The first version had a PDF, mm? so I know what could be the, you know, the, the, the problem behind it. But even if, if there is no this PDF, I miss the opportunity to take in notes. And I think this could be one of the reasons why we end up with a printed copy. Mm? So going through, mm, through the through the ebook, and, and this is from the point of view of, 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 of the instructor, from the point of view of the of students. So flipping. Mm, so maybe I'm too old, but right, flipping up and down hmm, on an ebook, it still is not so intuitive to me hmm, and how to jump from one place to, to another. Uh, but I found out that the students are not that familiar either. Hmm? Uh, and then the annotations, it's something, it's something imp important. Hmm? So you have the ebook there, but I think that creates a barrier hmm, of, uh, between, the, between what is the student and, and the resource. Then we have a printed book, and I think that's 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 great, and, and you no, know, it, it comes part of the probably of, of we are not still used, so we don't have the technology hmm, for this for these ebooks, but but it could be nice to be able to see if we could have personalized printed books hmm, in the sense of saying, well, I mean, we see the book, huh, so the, we want to to make the the printed book as attractive as possible. Nobody would probably use the whole book, it will be some chapters. It will be more attractive to students, it will be more attractive to instructors if you could say, oh, I want hmm, chapters 3, 4, 5, 10, and 12, hmm, and that's what I want for my students, and you could demand this. Hmm. I'm not coming up with these ideas. Hmm. So this actually, I talked to a publisher hmm, probably four or five years ago, hmm, and these publishers, this is one of the things they were trying to think about on the idea of saying, look, with the new technologies, Books are now, they are printed on demand, basically. So I could print not the whole book, but just, but just this type of chapters. Hmm? So there are things, hmm? there are ideas that, that, that came to mind. And then regarding material, I have some things here that I realized, uh, you know, I, I, I was wrong because I, hmm? and that I think, let me just give this tip in case somebody happens hmm? to be in the same situation as, as I was. When I signed to, to the economy, when I signed to core, Econ uh, online, so it was probably 2014, 2015, hmm? so at the very beginning. And of course, I just signed in. Later on, I saw that there was the option to, be an, to, to, become a, to sign as an instructor and get access to the resources. I did that, and I was under the assumption that I, were under, uh, that I was an instructor. So today, I found out that I am still looking at the book as a student. Hmm? So there are all these resources out there that I've been missing. Hmm? Uh, so, so the first, hmm, the first uh, point to, hmm, to, to the core icon, uh, group is to say it would be nice to see that, that you are logging as a student or you are logging as an instructor. And then for those who haven't, hmm, who, if you don't see that there is a huge material, a huge amount of material of slides and presentations and uh, tests and, you know, and I think also uh, some dynamics in the, in the graph and so on, it's there. Hmm? I cannot tell you too much about it, but let me tell you what I would like to see and probably it's already there. Huh? So and that's, I think. So, so I think hmm, that nowadays, and if we see the other books and we see the editorials, what they're putting all the money and they're putting all the resources is in making the books more attractive to professors which makes no sense, it should be more attractive to, to students. But 
I mean, we are economists. We know who. No? The, the, the decision maker is the one you, are, you want to convince. And, and the person who decides what's the, uh, what's the book to choose are the professors. Hmm? Professors are insensitive to prices, but they are sensitive to the resources they receive. So what we see the tendency in other books is, well, pricey books with a lot of investment in, in, in resources. So I think the importance of, of having hmm, problem set solutions and so on, it's, it's, it's really important. And, and also the way to introduce teaching innovation, which hmm, don't have much to say because I will talk about that and there are other people also talking. So I think the, the fact that we have this type of gatherings, it's, it's very promising. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have 10 minutes for questions. So shall we just collect some questions and then there is either Wendy or Sam that want to answer or if we want to join, yeah, Umberto's uh, comments. One of your other onerous duties is you have to um, join okay. us and, and answer the questions. <laughs> Okay, um, this is mostly to Sam, which is, um, don't you agree, or, and I'm not being clever about how I'm making a comment into a question, I could make a comment, but don't you agree that basically in this new paradigm, you have corrected the mistakes of the 20th century, mistakes they aren't, in fact, the deliberate way in which um, you don't want to call it neoliberal, but whatever you want to call the paradigm was based on justifying the free market as free as possible, in part in reaction to the, the, the rise at the time, especially in the 60s, the apparent rise of the, um, the alternative in the Soviet Union. And that what concerns me is how do you treat uh, or how can you manage to be pluralist if you only turn that upside down? And I say that as someone who shares the turning of it upside down. How do we also let students who actually support the old paradigm not feel as excluded as students feel now? That is, how do we not just turn it upside down? Uh, that doesn't mean that we give them equal weight, but that somehow there should be a voice that isn't there at the moment in core, as I see it. Uh, so the mirror opposite I know is, of course, the, um, the George Mason uh, marginal revolution people who also have something. And it seems to me that if I were teaching such a course, I'd want at least people to be exposed to that. And that some, uh, it's a challenge to them, some serious partnership in which there's cross uh, reference uh, so that you can still teach your vision and your paradigm and it's coherent at the same time that you're not completely shutting out the other view, uh, which is not only cynical, but is also genuinely, sincerely uh, people who believe that it's better for people. And, and on that, I mean, scientists have this too, so the Big Bang said his state was like that. But they, there was a religious component underneath what each of them wanted. And, but the steady state people were willing to, even though they still didn't believe in God, they were willing to believe the Big Bang won on facts, on evidence. And that somehow you want to argue we did win on evidence. It's evident. But nonetheless, the other shouldn't be silenced. And, and a good example I know, even though they meant it the other way, is the Hayek Keynes rap talk which genuinely gives enough room to Keynes, for example, if you were familiar with that one. Mm. And it was done by Hayek I'm people who felt me. excluded. That's too much already. Sorry, I'll stop. Uh, well, I, I, a question that begins with, don't you agree that? <laughs> <laughs> My first instinct is, well, let's see if I can find some way to disagree. But it was, it's not hard in this case. Uh, because first, I don't think anyone uh, reading our uh, work is going to feel that Hayek is excluded. He is given a huge amount of time. Uh, I've recently written a very laudatory paper uh, about uh, Hayek. Uh, and I mean, Hayek is all over this curriculum, as is Coase and others. So, and the reason for that is I think Hayek had a much better understanding of how markets work than, does, than did the neoclassical paradigms. So there's no, I mean, there's huge respect 
for Coe's, Hayek, others associated with the Chicago School, and so on. Uh, I think much more so than you would find in the standard textbook where Hayek or Coe's would not even be mentioned. Uh, uh, so I don't, there's nothing anti-market about Core. Mm -hmm. Uh, Core has a, is, a, is, is dedicated to using markets, improving the way they work, make them, them work uh, positively for human well-being, and don't try to use them where they won't work. Uh, so there's, uh, that's not what this is about. This is not inverting the old paradigm, uh, any more than Samuelson was inverting the Marshallian paradigm. That's not what he was doing. Uh, the second thing is, I don't think the people who promoted in the second half of the last century the uh, Walrasian paradigm or the neoclassical, I wouldn't call it neoliberal, for the following reason. The leaders of that were themselves left of center. Kenneth Arrow, uh, in, pub in, in print, defined himself as a socialist. Uh, and so there was, I mean, there, it wasn't any left or right about this. People were trying to figure out a model uh, and how it worked. And we were using mathematics uh, to try to understand it better. Uh, I think I was the first person teaching an advanced uh, micro course at Harvard. I was the first person, I believe, to make problem sets be a central part of how we teach. I now think that was a mistake because it was associated with a narrowing of the questions. Uh, and I remember at the time with my co-teacher thinking, well, you know, I wish we could get some problem sets about the really important questions, but we've cruised on anyway. Now, so I think that was a big detour, but I don't think it was from bad intentions, and I surely don't think it was ideologically driven. The use of those models was ideologically driven, but the leaders of that movement, I mentioned Arrow again, uh, certainly uh, did not have that as, as their intention. Now, what about the students who think that uh, laissez-faire is really a good policy when it comes to things like the environment uh, or public goods production and so on? Well, you know, I think what I owe to them is not to honor their false beliefs, but to try to give them some good economics. Uh, and uh, I do that, I mean, I, I think any, I think I can say this with quite a bit of confidence. I've had a lot of right-wing students in my classrooms. I teach in America. Uh, I don't think they've ever felt disrespected, honestly, uh, because of what I just said. I mean, I think I've learned a lot from the people I mentioned, and it's not just Kenneth Arrow, it's also the others. I think that's what the way we teach in CORE. We're hugely respectful of where these things come from. And I don't think that juxtaposing a moribund X paradigm with the current paradigm is a good idea. I think we should just move on. I'm not interested in criticizing it. I just want to do what's next because the, 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 the well-being of people depend on that. Uh, and I really don't think there's any disrespect. Uh, so I saw that you, you mentioned a lot about macro and micro, but not so much about econometrics. So uh, I guess nowadays how it is taught is micro and macro are more abstract and econometrics is more data driven. So usually you show the context a bit more and then show the methodology you could use. Uh, but actually they, the classes get very isolated from each other. So it's it's hard to like build on, uh, build on, and I would want to hear from you if there is a better way of teaching econometrics using core methodology, and if anyone has already done. Oh yeah, I've got the thing. Sorry, yeah, it's usually past the parcel. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, there, there are a number of responses to to what you've asked, and it, it, so the first thing is true that we started with the the principles course in in a sense and left aside the other things that the students are doing in their first year. So one of them is typically a maths for economics course. They do a, an applied economics course and usually some sort of introduction to uh, econometrics. Uh, we have uh, dipped our toes into this already. So the, the new project, the green, the second green one called Doing Economics is a course about data and hands-on uh, manipulation of data uh, with the intention of linking that very closely to the core. So the, the, uh, it, it's, it's actually set up, the, the projects are set up in parallel with the ESPP, Economy, Society and Public Policy, but they fit, uh, tie very well into different parts of core. And that, that is not an econometrics course. It, it's a course about descriptive 
statistics. It's about data and, and real data. And it, uh, uh, Eileen is going to talk about more about this tomorrow. But it's also, it, it starts off with, with other people's cleaned up data. So there's data on, on uh, temperature in the first unit because that doesn't really require any uh, economics. And then the second unit is, is about collecting data from experiments. So students actually do experiments. They can do it online if they're not in a classroom situation. So dealing with own generated data. And then the third one is about analyzing the uh, Berkeley sugar tax. And that uses the, the cleaned up data from that study, but the actually existing data to do uh, a differences in difference um, analysis of a policy. And then later on, so it goes on, there's actually one about well-being, there's uh, the measuring it, uh, there's one about uh, measuring management practices. So they, they move along and eventually you get to using um, uncleaned up data so that students actually get to, to, to deal with data that they have to sort out and learn those kind of skills as well. So that's, um, I think that's a very exciting project and it's, uh, it's not intended that students can kind of do one of these projects a week because they're, they're quite intensive, but even if they just did one or two of these projects, they'd learn a huge amount that they tend not to learn in an econometrics course or a standard way, a statistics course in the first year. The second thing is that we have got um, a proposal for a core econometrics course, which, which comes from Manchester, where they've very successfully taught um, a flipped classroom second year econometrics course. And so Ralph Becker and Rachel Griffiths are behind that initiative. And the, their idea is really to use the power of the, the flipped classroom to get students doing a lot of the, the, the kind of heavy lifting on their own, very guided with short videos and so on. And then the face-to-face -face is about motivation and, and application and, and so that to try and get around the problem of an extraordinarily dry uh, theorem-driven approach to econometrics, which is often even more unpopular as a second year course than the intermediate micro course. So yeah, so we, I think we have some exciting developments happening there. Okay, any other question? Quick, I'm aware that you are all hungry. <laughs> so, sorry, Sam. Uh, I want to ask uh, you a question from Bertrand. Uh, you, you, uh, you've been teaching intro for a long time and uh, obviously very engaged in it. How do you teach the positive normative distinction in your classes? Uh, it, uh, so in, in my classes, it doesn't show. Uh, so it doesn't show in the text. Mm. It's, so I do emphasize all the time the difference between what it is and what it should be. Mm. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the distinction. Uh, I haven't found the material, so that's why I always search for it, and that's why I, I try to search here. So it's clear that in the core and, and the parts, so the parts, it's, it's clear that put a lot of emphasis and on the idea of uh, what is desirable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the idea that there is some social norm and some values, ethical values. And, and I think at some point in the, in the book it says that on ethical values, economists will always disagree. Uh, I read that as a way of trying to shut down that kind of conversation, which I thought it could be interesting to talk about it. So it's true that they may disagree, but it could be good to know what they disagree on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK? Uh, so yeah, that's, I mean, what, what we tried to do about this is we tried to, we're, I mean, I, I think we share the same view. Uh, we're very uh, sort of fed up with students, uh, uh, sort of very elevated sense of subjectivism, whereby on any question having to do with anything which has to do with values, that one person says, well, I believe this, and the other well, I believe that, and that's the end of the conversation. And this ignores the fact that very smart people have been dealing with trying to develop a language whereby not that we can always eliminate all of the disagreements, but that we can narrow down the disagreements by using interesting thought experiments like the veil of ignorance, for example. So we introduced the veil of ignorance with uh, discussion questions about that. And we would really welcome ways of uh, advancing that particular uh, aspect of the curriculum because obviously we're not going to tell them what they ought to think. 
We're not going to tell them that if you adopt this philosophical language, you'll be able to eliminate disagreements. But we do want to insist that they can go a lot further than saying, well, I believe this and I believe that, and that's it. Because we want the normative discussion to be part of what students have about economics. Um, and uh, obviously, we need your help on that. Experiments is a good way to do it, because in the experiments, the students are always interested in, well, that was unfair, that wasn't fair, or that is a pretty dumb outcome for this. And you know, you can then use that information. But we need a, a better language, I think. Yeah. OK, so if there is not any other quick question, I'm going to break now for lunch. I think lunch is going to be served just outside. There are no doubt, but we'll find out. And I guess you can ask questions during lunch as well. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.